You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for hitting that play button. It's another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Before we get to today's episode with uh, Michael K. Snyder, I just want to say thank you to everybody who continues to share this podcast. Uh, show on social media and gives it a five-star review on iTunes. All of this immensely helps the podcast. Uh, It's always great when other people are actually sharing it as well, so it doesn't look like it's just me sharing it all the time. So a huge thank you to everyone. And if you're also interested in having me help you with your podcast, here's a very, very cheap and effective way to have this done. I have a, a gig I created on Fiverr, so for $5, I can help you brainstorm ideas for your podcast. Uh, you know, I get asked all the time about what gear to use. Hey, what can I do for a show, for a concept? What can I do for this, that, and the other thing? For $5, you can pick my brain for whatever you want. I mean, you can't beat that. Literally, you cannot beat having somebody with over five or six years uh, experience in podcasting for $5. Uh, you know, I've been doing this show for three years And I, you know, I have been doing other podcast shows for another three years. I've done podcasting for higher ed. I've done podcasting for stuff like this. I've used all different types of setups. So trust me, for five bucks, that's a hell of a deal. And, you know, I'm I'm working on a lot of other things too. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for all the continued support. And again, thank you to Kurt Weiser because I just actually resubmitted to get myself verified on Twitter. I, you know, I don't understand why Twitter doesn't like me. I just don't get it. But anyways, you know, speaking of of, of this podcast, uh, you know, I've been doing this for three years now, since 2014, and this guy, this person was my first actual guest. It, the first three episodes are considered lost, uh, because basically they didn't turn out quite so right, and it, it was even funny, because when I started doing this, I had a professional level studio, and it still wasn't working right. So eventually, I ended up uh, for episode four. I got myself a headset, started recording that way in a uh, in a system that no longer even works. And uh, then after that, I've I've upgraded and upgraded and upgraded. And now we're doing it the way we do it right now, with all pro grade equipment, uh, an actual mixer, all this good stuff. And here we are, and here we go. My next guest is a graduate of Full Sail University's film and entertainment business programs. He's the founder of Crash Films, Inc. He's an independent film producer. He's a screenwriter. This guy has done so many crazy, awesome things, and we're going to get into all that. And we're going to talk a lot about screenwriting and development. And also, we talk a little bit about networking, too, because he didn't just go out to L.A. without a plan, without knowing anybody. He actually had a plan in place, and he's doing some really awesome things. And why don't we just go right into it? This is episode 158 with guest Michael K. Snyder. You're listening to the Dave Bullis Podcast. Mike, you were the you were the guest on the first ever episode. The episode is now considered a part of the lost episodes. Uh, the first three are considered the lost episodes. You were number one. You were my first guest, and uh, it's so good three years later to have you actually back on. Uh, so, Mike, again, I want to say thank you very much for joining us. And uh, it's kind of funny how we've come full circle now, all the way back from three years ago. Man, I'm so happy to be back on the show. You know, it is it is. It's kind of funny that we that we have come full circle. You're, you're totally right. And just thinking about some of the progressions that we've both made in our careers and, and how things have changed, it's just really interesting. Yeah, and it, it's funny too because when I when we last did the interview, uh, I, again it was it was uh, remotely like we're doing right now, but I was in a actual studio doing it, and I had nothing but problems there. And now I'm doing it from my uh, my office, and, I, and you know it, it's just ten thousand times better because I remember when we had the episode and I listened to it, and I was like, what the hell happened here? And it was that freaking recorder was not would never work right. So I, for the first two episodes, I did I used that recorder in this really awesome radio station that was soundproof, and then all of a sudden now. It's like, you know, I, I, I mean, it just even technology, how it's improved in three freaking years is unbelievable. It's crazy. Yeah, it is unbelievable. 
So, you know, Mike, uh, since that episode is a little lost, uh, well, actually, it is lost. Sorry, since that episode is lost, you know, I, I want to dig a little into your background for those of you, uh, for those listeners who aren't really aware of, you know, all the things that you've done. So, you know, you were actually a graduate of Full Sail University. You graduated in what, 2010? Um, oh, man. I graduated Full Sail's film program in 2000. 2010, 2011, and then I graduated their master's program um, a couple years after that. So I moved out to L.A. in about 2014, 2015. Oh, okay. So then, uh, so see, I, again, I, I just found out I didn't even know you graduated from the master's program. So see, I'm finding out yeah, stuff, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you, so you move out to L.A. Now, we actually met uh, through through trauma, through Lloyd Kaufman. And you know, when, right. when, while and that was while you were actually at Full Sail. So when you were at Full Sail, do you think you know that, that you had a lot more opportunities that that you wouldn't have had anywhere else? Um, so sort of like to work on a lot of these different movies. Um, I don't know. I I don't really think that um, you know, film school in in general matters as much as a lot of people want to say it does. I think you know, given what I know now, if I could go back, I probably would have tried to work a little bit harder and high school and, and tried to get into like USC or UCLA just because I feel like, you know, it's, it's really all about your network. And if you can get in out here a little earlier, it just makes it so much easier to meet executives or meet agents or meet managers or producers. Cause a lot of them are going to be in the same class as you. Whereas if you're, you know, in Florida and you go into a school that anybody, you know, is pretty much paying to go to because it's private it's it's just not the same pool of resources. But that's not to say that they didn't help me get jobs out here and introduce me to a lot of people. But I would say that a lot of what I would consider to be my own success um, is just based on me reaching out to people myself. Yeah, you know, they, there's that old saying: uh, your net worth is your, your. I'm sorry, your network is your net worth. And uh, you know, that's 100 percent true. It, it really is, Mike. Honest to God, even even if you do something as, as obvious as like crowdfunding, obviously, and you know, you go out and you're like, well, hey, I need people to, to 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 invest in this project. Or if you're doing something like even this podcast, or even doing something like like releasing a film, if if you don't have a network built up, you really don't have any way to really distribute the thing unless you're literally trying to build it as you're doing it, which is uh, which is like shooting yourself in the foot. That's absolutely right. So, so when 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 you say you should you you wish you had applied yourself in high school uh, to go out to like USC and stuff like that. I mean, no, Mike, I, I trust me, man. I feel you. I, I did the same thing in high school, man. I, I honestly, and when senior year came around, I didn't give a shit about anything. That's right. I I literally, man, I, like my teachers were like, Dave, you know, you don't apply yourself anymore, and I'm like, I don't care. I just want to get the hell yeah. out of here. Exactly. That's how I was. <laughs> I was I was I was like that before my I was, I was like that in like the eighth grade so you know <laughs> like, you know I, I went to two different high schools and and uh, I you know the funny part is when I was a junior in high school I took an English uh, I was in an English honors class because I finally had a teacher who kind of convinced me to apply myself with writing and she actually did an informational interview assignment where you had to reach out to a professional in your field or or where you wanted to go into the career you wanted to go into so I was like. Well, shit, man, I want to be a, you know, writer, director. I mean, Spielberg's not going to return my calls. You know, I can't really reach out to Scorsese. So who can I reach out to? And that's actually how I met Lloyd uh, with Troma um, and started working like the conventions in Florida with him, uh, which is just, just really funny. And I think that was a moment where I, my, my mind kind of opened up a little bit where it was like, OK, maybe you should just focus on this and focus on, on filmmaking and writing and, and, and your network. So when I went to high school, I mean, obviously in Florida, when you go to high school, there's not like a, there's not even like a film history class, but like a film theory, like elective. It's all just the, the brass tacks high school stuff. And, and I was, I, there was nowhere for me to apply myself in the career that I really wanted to, except for in this one creative writing class, you know, and I think there's something to say about the arts programs in schools with that, because I wouldn't be in the situation I'm in right now if I hadn't you know, taking that course and made that decision. And I wish there was more of those types of opportunities for people, you know, and students. Yeah. It, it, it would show you that there's more out there than just sort of like, you know, you know, options A, B and C. That's right. 
So, and, and, you know, that's something, too, that, you know, even when I was in high school, man, uh, we would always watch these movies, all these freaking movies. We would go to, like, all the local video stores. Uh, you know, most people who listen to this podcast know what, what those were. Uh, you know, like the blockbusters, yeah. the Hollywood videos. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, man. And stuff like that. And then, uh, but, but you know, we would always rent these movies. We'd go out, and every Friday, Saturday night or whatever, we'd go out, and we'd, we'd just be watching all sorts of different movies and all these crazy freaking stuff. And it didn't even dawn on me at that point, dude, that I, I could make a, you know, a, I could do this for a living. I just figured that the, right. everyone who wrote and made movies was, like, you know, granted these special privileges by, like, the President of the United States or some crap. You know what I mean? Right, right, <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's, it's the unattainable goal. You know, it's, it's out there. But you have no what you have no idea how to, you know, map your road to success in that field. There's there, there weren't a lot of resources, you know, and it's crazy. It was literally like you go and you watch movies and you think, you know, I remember when I was ten years old, I was watching Close Encounters, and I was like, this is great, you know, and, and it was the first time my my parents ever were like, well, you know, someone wrote that movie, and it was like a light bulb went off in my brain, like somebody writes movies, you know, it's it's, it's just the craziest thing, but. Now I think there's a lot, there's a few more resources just years later and not that many years, but there really weren't when I was in high school. Yeah, it, it, it was uh, sort of like, you know, you have to go to college, you have to do this stuff. And uh, when I went Absolutely. to, you know, and when I went to college, I didn't know, I didn't know any, uh, exactly what I wanted to major in. And, um, right. you know, I, I bounced around from major to major, but I was always, you know, in my spare time, I was practicing writing and I actually, the first book I ever got on screenwriting was a book called uh, The Screenwriter's Bible by David Trottier. Um, and, yes. And uh, I bought that, and that just sort of, like, opened the floodgates. And now I was, like, you know, getting different movies and trying to figure out, you know, how to actually – how they wrote that stuff and how, how I do it. I'll still do it. But, um, but then, then you start to realize, oh, my God, there are people out there who actually make movies. And I actually – and if that – I guess maybe it was, like, 2006 or seven. I actually really got into it, and I was like, you know, talking to independent filmmakers. I found them on 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 MySpace. Remember MySpace, Mike? Yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, I do. <laughs> I think mine's like like I think I went went to great lengths to delete mine. <laughs> I uh, mine was actually deleted for me. Uh, I, I, I got a notice one day. They were like, we're going to just terminate all these uh, unused MySpace accounts. And yours is one of them. And I said, honestly, burn that guy, that burn that thing to the ground. Yeah, man. please take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anyone see this. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's it, 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 it's. I have, I have a friend of mine who who still has or he had one, and I was like, my God, man! I go that that that's like a uh, uh, something from your childhood. That's like an embarrassing moment. You're just like, please never bring that up again. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I actually right. I, I actually met some from filmmakers through MySpace, and uh, and and some of these guys were actually in like Jersey and New York, and uh, you know, I never right. really put two and two together that there there's there was a lot more. Um, there wasn't well, well, there, yeah, there was a lot more in the in the whole bigger area. I don't want to say PA because there really wasn't that many in PA at that t- time. But but like sure. New York and Jersey, there was a few people. Most didn't respond back um, because most were looking for like producers that could fund and give them money. Uh, some actually yeah, was, money right exactly. And most actually did though you know come back and say okay here's what you can do, and then I just you know went from there. But. But, you know, what, what I'm trying to say with all this is it, it, it's similar to what you did with Lloyd. And you reached out to him and said, you know, I can do, you know, I should see how I could actually work with this guy. And, and you, you, you made an opportunity for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I took a class assignment and I, I reached out to him. I shot him an email. And I was like, hey, I want to do an, an interview with you over the phone, you know, and just talk about your career and, and how you've made something out of nothing and continue to do so. And, um, he responded back with a cell phone number and that was, that was it. And then it was just really up to me to, to keep him pinned down and, and, and stay on top of him as much as possible, you know, whenever he was in town or I went to New York and met, saw him, you know, and different things. It was, it was just to keep, to keep the relationship alive. Yeah. And, and, and you know, now with technology, we're able to actually, you know, keep in contact with people a lot better. Um, and so, right. and, and also it's a double edged sword because then you're, you're getting too much contact with, with everyone right, right. Get, get, get you at once. Right. Uh, but you know, right. but you made an opportunity, you, you reached out even if it was for a class or, and, and you made sure to make a contact. And, and I think that's so important 
And and I think, and also you did it the professional way. I mean, I just had Whitney Davis on the podcast for the second time, and we talked about networking the right way. And you know, the first time that you you contact somebody, you shouldn't be asking for something. Right. No. Totally. And, uh, and, 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 you know, you, you actually were offering something for Lloyd and he took you up on that. And then again, now, you know, and here we are all, all these years later, cause I, I, and, and because when you, when you, um, uh, were on that trauma film, uh, we met through that cause that's when I, I met Lloyd, uh, and then we started talking and then I, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, that's how we met. And then, then, uh, there's, and, you know, I've met a few other people through Lloyd and, uh, Lloyd, you know, Lloyd's always doing something on independent films. Uh, he's something. a connector, man. I yeah. mean, he's, he's the great connector, you know? I mean, he just, if, if he's able to put you on the phone or, or in the room with somebody that you want to be on the phone or in the room with, he'll, he'll do whatever he can to, to, to be the one to do it, who does it, you know? And, and then he'll take all credit for it, which he rightfully deserves. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I I remember reading his uh, his uh, independent film book, and it was just absolutely hilarious. And I was like, see, he's yeah, making, he's, great. he's he's making independent film you know fun. It it it's not t- taken too seriously. And you know his and uh, when he was on the podcast, he uh, he said he found a trauma in prison with uh, Michael Hertz. Uh, and uh, he was Michael Hertz's bitch, and uh, Michael, <laughs> and uh, they found a trauma in prison. And uh, I'm like, wow. Yeah. And, I, and I, afterwards, the, after the interview, I, I said to him, I go, Lloyd, do you ever think that someone's going to listen to this for the first time, not hearing of you or trauma, and think, wow, that guy really started a movie mm-hmm. business in prison? <laughs> He's probably like, I hope so, you know? <laughs> It's not far from the truth, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Uh, you know, I, I've, you know, and, and Lloyd is, you're right, he's a very good connector. Uh, he's always connecting, yeah. you know, different people. And, uh, you know, again, because he connected us, and, and um, I, I, right. I've, I've met him on different film sets uh, uh, multiple times. And so, you know, after you got off this, you know, just to continue your story, after you got off, you know, the, the working on Trauma, and, you know, you sort of, you went back to Full Sail, you know, at what point did you want to, did you realize that you wanted to go back for your, for a master's at, at full sale? Um, at the beginning, just because it was kind of part of the deal with, um, my parents and just the way that they structured their programs. It was like, if you, it was like, they had a deal, like it was like a BOGO. Like if you buy one degree, you know, we can give you the second degree at, at a certain cost that was thousands of dollars less than it would have been had you decided to do it later because every so many years they restructure their programs and they change the cost. So it just happened to be that when we sat down with um, a representative of full sale, they were just, they were like, now, if you want to take the master's program in business, you know, we can, we can, we can go ahead and lump it in with the film program and it'll end up costing you less money later on. And, you know, it was like a, it was like no time, you know, it was so quick because it's such an accelerated program that my parents were like, you might as well. And, and I mean, at that point it was kind of whatever they wanted to do. I was really doing it more for them. I, I think I kind of knew that I needed to move somewhere and just start working. Um, but you know, to, to, to keep everything cool at home and, and to put a diploma on the wall, I was like, yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. And, and you know, uh, again, it's good that you had a plan because uh, honestly, like you can become like me, and you know, obviously have no plan and just kind of figure your way out. But but no, it's good that you had a but plan. But it's tough, man. There's not really a plan out there. You know, it's yeah. like you you just have to figure it out. There's not really a right or wrong way to do this. I think I, I, I you just have to you have to do it. You have to just set goals and hit those goals. And those goals can be anything as long as you know that at the end of that list there's some sort of success and whatever that success is doesn't have to be monetary success. It could just be moving to Los Angeles or moving to New York or getting a show, a, a gig on a show or anything. You know, there's not really, there, there's not really a way to teach this. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, moving to LA and uh, I, I, that's actually what I want to ask next is, you know, you, yeah. you, so you got the masters and then you moved out to LA. I think you said uh, 2014 is when you moved out. It was, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm horrible with dates, so I'm probably butchering it, but let's just say that. And um, basically what happened is after I was done with the film program and I went to the masters, all of my film school friends had already moved out to Los Angeles. So by the time I was done, you know, I had couches to sleep on which is really key when you're moving from, you know, Podunk, Florida to one of the most expensive cities in the nation. It's, it's, it's nice to be able to find somewhere to sleep while you're getting your footing or finding your footing. Right. And uh, so I hooked up with the career development program at Full Sail, and they got me an internship out here. 
And I called one of my friends and he was like, man, you can come out here. You can sleep on my couch for as long as you want or need to, you know, I know that you're not getting paid anything with your internship. So just, just get out here. Like, that's all we want. So we, we just want you out here. So I flew out and moved in with him and started my internship. Um, and it was interesting. I was running a 10,000 square foot warehouse in downtown Los Angeles for uh, Maura Tierney and Anthony Riva Var and Sean Wing and a few other actors and um, Nathan Heaney, who's a great director of photography now. Um, and they basically, they pulled their resources. They rented this massive warehouse, right? And it's like really old warehouse in, in downtown and they needed some young kids to run it. So there was one other guy who was managing it and I interned there. And after a couple months, they hired me on as his like assistant. And then after a couple months, I got his job. So I ended up doing that for a couple of years and opened a second location in Burbank with um, Stacey Cher, who everyone knows is Tarantino's producing partner or was, and her husband, Carrie Brown, who's a really good friend. Um, and we did a lot of really cool stuff, man. And it was a lot of fun. And I got to meet a lot of really great people my first couple of years out here, which is always nice. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you mentioned having couches to sleep on. Uh, that was actually be one, yeah. one of my questions because having that network since everyone already moved out there, you know, and, and having those couches to sleep on and places to crash and, and, and you know, people. It's key. Yeah, exactly. It, it is key. And again, our, your network is your net worth. And uh, again, you, right. you, you were able to actually, you know, uh, uh, go out there and not just be like, all right, so what next? I mean, I've had friends, Mike who've gone out to LA and sort of been like with, with no plan and been like, okay, what next? It's like, well, yeah, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer if you do that. Yeah. yeah. You're going to really, really reality is going to hit you very fast. Totally. So you, now you mentioned you, you got the, you know, the warehouse job at, now at this point, were you always writing scripts and did you maybe have a few scripts to show to, to, to different, like maybe producers or agencies? Yeah, I mean, I, I started writing screenplays when I was probably 11 years old, pen and paper. Then I figured out how to adjust the macros in Word. Then I figured out, you know, you could get Celtics and all these freeware. Then I found out that there were all these forums and, and independent script hosting sites online. So I was always putting material out there. I mean, I was just pushing short films and, and short stories and, and really shitty features out there and whatever I could just to, to get reads and get comments because um, that's, you know, structure is key from from that point of view um so by the time i moved to los angeles i had some features kind of under my belt and i had one in particular that i was i think the most proud of and working on the hardest and basically I, I i started reaching out to people and and while i was out here for those first couple of years i was also producing short films because i had this awesome ten thousand square foot warehouse that would be rented out for events and films and stuff you know half of the year and then it would just be sitting there for the other half of the year. So I would get my buddies who had red cameras and lenses and all these different things and we would produce short films and we would write them and produce them and I had two that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival um, you know, two different years. So I used that and I used um, like kind of my background and I sent an email to Carson who runs Script Shadow. Um, some people love him, some people hate him, whatever. And I attached a feature that I'd written that I was pretty proud of. Um, and he agreed to host it on his site for one of the, you know, independent hostings that he does. And I would say I got a hundred emails from people that were basically, this sucks. You, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a dumb millennial. I mean, literally that. And I got one email from somebody who ended up being my manager. So, but you know, and, and Mike, I want to ask you about the the manager email in a second. But I want to before I do, yeah. I want to ask you why why do you think you got so much hate mail? Do, do you think it was from a lot of? <laughs> ang- well, no, I, I, I have I have my own theory about what, it, what why you got so much hate mail. And my theory is this: there's a lot of people who have unrealized dreams, and whenever they kind of see someone coming down the pipeline, it's like a chance to sort of uh, almost like if I can throw off all this frustration and, and anger and resentment onto somebody else for just even five seconds, I'm going to take that shot. That's my theory about it. But w- why do you think you got so much of those angry emails? Yeah, I think it's a combination of that. And I think that, you know, I, I may have come off as a little, little arrogant. Cause I was like, look, you know, I've, I've pr- produced these two short films, you know, I'm like 25, you know, 24, 25 years old. And I just could really benefit from hosting this script. 
um, yada, yada, yada. And I, I think it's a combination of people misreading my intentions and, and also just what you're saying. It's like armchair, you know, screenwriter reviewers, screen, screenplay reviewers. They're sitting there and they're rewriting movies in their heads in, on their sofa, but they're not actually out there hitting the pavement. And because of that inability to motivate themselves, they, they're haters. Yeah, it's um, it, that that's what I think is, is is that they they're very angry and they're very, uh, you know, and it's totally. a shame. A lot of the a lot of people in this business, there's a lot of awesome people, and you and I talk about this, you know, because uh, we talk a lot, and we talk about how sometimes this business is stereotyped as everyone is bitter, angry, out to get you, but there's a ton of awesome people in this business. And, there are, man. Yeah, yeah totally. And it's just, and but it, but it's unfortunate, like situations like that, where it's like you really see the the sort of dark side, where it's like, what the hell is this? There was actually a, uh, a screenwriting group I used to be a part of uh, on Facebook. It was a Facebook group, and I think it was it was set to private or or whatever. And right. I remember people would post in there, and they would post stuff that was completely wrong, and. You, you, you would sit there and you try to correct it, you know, and just not, not, not like say, like, hey, you're wrong, but just say, hey, there's another way to do this. They would jump all over people. And finally, I said, why the hell am I a part of this freaking group anymore? And it, it's funny. Yeah, it, it's, it can't all be negative. Yeah. You know, it has to be. It has to be. There has to be optimism because it's such a hard industry to break into that if all people are bringing is, is negativity, you're just going to stop someone from potentially achieving their dream. And, and it's almost too like when when uh, you know pr- when you're actually producing a film, you know, if, if you have yeah. people around you who are constantly just being like problem spotters and not problem solvers, you know, those right. those are the type of people that you got to like jettison from the project as soon as possible. Oh, totally, man. It's 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 you can boil it down to you know, don't bring me the problem, bring me the solution, really. Yeah, yeah, it, you hit the nail uh, right on the head, Mike. And uh, you know, so so as you sort of go back to talking about script shadow, you got one email that was from a manager who said, you know, I want to talk to you. So yeah, he was like, I think you showed a lot of talent on the page. Um, a little bit about me, he gave me his background, and he was like, let's you know, let's grab some coffee. And he, we went and we got coffee, and uh, I thought he was great. Thought he was really knowledgeable, nice guy, and you know, I, I kind of just pitched myself as hard as I could. And at the end of the meeting, he was kind of like, all right, what do you want to do? And at this point I had an idea of what I wanted my next project to be. And and I had, I chose something that I felt was, you know, probably not going to get made, but if I could partner with the right person, I could get in front of the people who would potentially make it. And that would open all the other doors for me. Um, and it was a script I wrote called The Mouse Who Would Be King, and it's the story of Mickey Mouse and, and how Walt Disney developed and created Mickey Mouse. And it ends with creation of Mickey Mouse, and I wrote it um, in a very Roger Rabbit way where you see what he's thinking and all these different things. Um, and so I told him that, and I was like, it's never going to get made, but let's put it out there, let's take meetings, and let's get into development because you know we have time, we can do this now. And he kind of like looked at me and he was like, all right, let's do it. And we shook hands and, and we went from there. So, and then where did you go from there? Did you go to start actually going to like all these different like pitch meetings and stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, we beat out the story, you know, I had the, the story cause I grew up in Florida. Right. And, and we went to Disney world all the time. And at Disney world, they have an exhibit called one man's dream where you can go in and it's like a Disney museum. And then there's this movie at the end where it basically explains how Walt had created Oswald, the lucky rabbit. And it was stolen from him or, you know, he didn't really understand the full paradigms of his contract and Universal owned it. And he put all this work into it. And he's like, I should own this because I put all this work into it. And on the train ride back home to tell his team and his wife, he started coming up with Mickey Mouse. So I knew that that's what I wanted to end the movie with. Like I had my end scene. I had the idea of Walt Disney going on a train and having like, this just epiphany of Mickey Mouse and the way that I wanted to dramatize it was to actually have Mickey Mouse walk onto the train car with him. So we beat out the story and, and we, you know, I read a bunch of books and kind of just filled my manager's head with all this knowledge of Disney that he didn't otherwise know. And then we wrote it and I wrote drafts and drafts and drafts and drafts um, while still working at the studio. And he was like, finally, you know, we, we nailed it down. And he started sending it. I sent it to agencies, sent it to production companies, executives, producers, all sorts of people. 
And then the real game began and I started taking meetings. So how long was it before, you know, you, you talked to the manager, you, you would beat it out and before you got meetings, how, how long was that whole time period there? Oh man. I mean, I really knew the story. So I think it was kind of an easier development process and it was just he and I, so there were weren't a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, I mean, probably a six months, seven months. And then I started taking meetings. So when, when you actually started to take these meetings, what were some of the, what, what was some of the feedback that you were getting? I mean, everyone loved the script. It was, it was, it was something where they were like, you know, we love the script and, and we want to know what else you're working on. And, and if we can find something to work on together. Um, and I started developing, like I developed a TV show with one guy that didn't go anywhere. I developed a TV show with um, Image Movers, which is Robert Zemeckis' company that didn't go anywhere. And I took that and I took that somewhere else. And everything kind of led into other projects. Every, every meeting I had, every conversation I had ended up giving me something else to work on or they had something that I could fit into or I showed some sort of interest in a project that they brought up in a meeting. And then, you know, that, that's really key is you, you go in there and of course I'm nervous, you know, and I'm, I'm moved out here to do this and I'm going to meet with these big guys. Right. And they can be very intimidating. And the key is really to sell them on what your brand is and what your personal story is. And if you can do that, they're going to try and find something that they have that almost feels like a perfect fit for you. And then you just have to capitalize on it. And none of those projects went anywhere, but they led to other conversations and other development things and, and other specs that led to where I am today. So you use that Mickey Mouse script and that, that sort of became like a calling card script to get your it foot did, yeah. to, get, to get your foot in the door. And they were saying, you know, did they say to you, hey, Mike, we love, you know, uh, the mouse would be king. What else do you have? Yeah, I mean, there was a little bit of that. It was like, what else are you thinking about? Like, what else are you writing? Um, and then based on that, it was like, if I was writing something that was sci fi, they would say, oh, well, we have this sci fi thing or we or we're looking at this book. What do you think about this book? Um, or for instance, when I went to image movers, it was more so about the fact that I used to box and I was an amateur boxer and, and they had a producer who had optioned all of FX tools, short stories and FX tool wrote million dollar baby. Right. So they had optioned all of them except for million dollar baby. Cause obviously Warner's has that. And they were like, would you be interested in trying to build a TV show based on these short stories? And of course you say, yes. Um, and then I started developing that. And when that fell through, I took all of the FX tool references out of what we had been working on. And I wrote a spec pilot just without all those references. And I filled it with my own personal experiences from boxing. And then that pilot became my TV calling card. And then we sent that out to everybody. And, and so when, when you sent that out to everybody, did you sort of have like a whole nother round of, of meetings with like the same oh, sort of yeah, management man. companies or was it different? Management it's it's kind of like a, like an album, like you write an album and then you go on a tour and you do all these concerts. Like that's kind of how I look at it. You write a script, you give it to some of your manager or your agent, they send it around to everybody and then people finally get back to them and they want to meet with you. And then you go on a tour, you know, and then, and, and you're basically going to all these different generals and all these different meetings and, and hoping that something turns into something else. You know, I never feel like the specific project that I'm going in with is going to sell. You know, I'm not there to sell that project. I always feel like I'm there to sell myself as a writer and, and to get on something that either they already have or to just open that line of communication where I can pitch them something later on. And, and so when, when, when you, you know, you're building relationships, relationships. So now you're, that's, that's it. Yeah. And so now they know when you come to the door, like, Oh, you know, there's Michael K. Snyder. He's, he, he's right. the guy that was, you know, brought the whole Disney project and he's done this. And, you know, so, and, and you, you know, you, so they're sort of, you're building a good reputation for yourself. Yeah. Cause this whole town is relationships and that's really all it is. You know, somebody who I met, you know, five years ago and was a, you know, creative exec somewhere is now, you know, VP production at a studio, right? And I can go to them and be like, you know, just, just by, just because I've, I've kept in contact with all these people throughout the years um, and then they move up and they change and their mandates change. And you never know when you're going to have something that fits 
their mandate. Yeah, because you know, uh, you know, tastes change. You know, and now everybody—I right. I swear, Mike—the the number one question and the number one thing I hear from doing this podcast is, you know, always have a TV pilot ready because now they yeah. all—they want something. Everybody wants something episodic now. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I meet with some producers who they don't want a pilot; they want a pitch. Um, and the specific networks who they have a deal with or whoever they've worked with has, you know, their mandate is, you know, we want to hear the pitch and then develop the pilot because there's money. Um, and then some producers are like, we only want to take a, a, a spec pilot out. You know, we don't want a pitch. We don't want a Bible. We just want to get the spec and then take that out. So it's really, you know, it's, everyone's different. Every network's different. Every company's different. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, now with everybody else getting into the game, like, you know, like Amazon, I mean, even, even, even from a few years ago, you know, in Amazon, uh, there's always rumors that Walmart is going to get into the uh, custom content game. And I mean, you just yeah. see all these, these different players now popping up and all the other players are still there, like your Netflix, right. uh, you know, and, and, and then Hulu and all your big, your big uh, studios. So it's just, you know, now it's like you have a lot of options as a writer. That's right. Yeah, you do. It's just, you know, getting into the conversation. So, and as we talk about getting into the conversation, uh, you know, you had just recently pitched a treatment uh, for a sequel for a, uh, a very well-known movie. And I know you can't talk too much about it, but, uh, uh, you know, can you just tell, you know, all the listeners about, you know, wh- what the treatment was that you pitched? Yeah, yeah, totally. So basically what happened is um, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go back and kind of preface it with another story. Um, I was sent an article from, you know, by my girlfriend about this SeaWorld orca trainer named John Hargrove, who worked at SeaWorld for 14 years and became like this elite killer whale trainer and quit. And he wrote a memoir. So, I mean, of course, again, growing up in Orlando, I have pictures of myself as a little kid, like sitting on Shamu, right? You know, so I'm like, I don't want to see blackfish. I don't want to know anything about it. I know it's probably terrible, but I don't need that guilt, you know? So she sent me this article and I read it and I was so drawn into that rabbit hole that I just, I totally just jumped in and I bought his book and I read it overnight and I started like, as I'm reading the book, I'm like highlighting scenes that I see in my head and different things. And he's, the author is just so interesting. His personal story is so interesting beyond the fact that he worked at SeaWorld. And the day after I read it, uh, my girlfriend was in Long Beach um, and just randomly, it's really funny, met the author who doesn't even live out here. And she went up to him and was like, you got to talk to my boyfriend. He's got a great idea. He knows how to turn your book into a movie. He can do it. We can do it together. You know, give him a call. So before he could call me, I'd already like typed up a pitch, you know, of why I should write this movie and, and what my version of his story is, which was essentially to take audiences into the tank with him and grow that emotional connection that he had with the killer whale. And so I sent him the email, called me the next day, and we talked for like four hours um, and just became really good friends. And and uh, he was pretty much like, all right, where do I sign? So from there, we wrote a 30-page treatment, and he took that and we pitched it all over town to all different companies. And the consensus was, this movie's great, you know, this idea is great, but we need you to spec the script. So I spec that feature out. Um, and then we sent that back and it just, it just, at that point, you know, this is a matter of a a few months just to go back to what we were just talking about. Those companies had already changed their mandate and it was like, well, now we're looking for thrillers or now we're looking for Netflix or Amazon. And we don't think this fits that mandate, blah, blah, blah. So it's fine. So we sent that around and, and I had met with an executive at Ellen Pompeo's company. Um, Calamity Jane and Ellen Pompeo is Meredith Gray on Grey's Anatomy. And we had talked about a couple projects and she is a big anti SeaWorld person. So, you know, they only have a TV deal with ABC. They don't do any films. So I reached out to my manager, you know, on my, my girlfriend's like, you need to, you need to send it over to them. And I'm like, well, they only have a TV deal. And she's like, just do it, just do it. Because the moral of my life and right now is my girlfriend, Rachel's always right to be completely honest with you. And every time she tells me that I need to do something, she's, and I disagree with her and I end up doing it, everyone benefits from it. So I've learned that the hard way, but she, she's always right. And so we sent it over to them and they called and they were like, we love this. You know, we don't know how to 
do this, but we love this. We want to reach out to someone else to try and see if we can partner with them because we don't make movies. And it just so happened that the person that they wanted to reach out to was Lauren Schuler Donner, who of course um, is the amazing producer of all the X-Men films and Deadpool and she produced Free Willy. And she's the wife of Richard Donner, who everyone knows is the director of Superman, The Omen, Lethal Weapon, Goonies, all that. And they're big anti-captivity, anti-fur, anti-zoo, all that. So we went down the line with them and, and they were interested. And at the end of the day, it just wasn't something that they felt they wanted to go down again because they, again, they produced Free Willy and they got kind of attacked for that at a time. And they were like, we don't really want to do that again. So my manager went in and he met with the head of their company and he was like, well, what else does Mike want to do? And my manager started talking to him about a couple of projects that I had that everyone considers to be Amblin in tone, as in Steven Spielberg's production company, of course. And he was like, well, we wanted to do a Goonies 2 for a long time. And we've heard a lot of pitches and we've gotten a lot of treatments from basically every writer in Hollywood. And nobody can get, you know, Dick and Steven and Chris Columbus to agree on their version of the sequel. What do you want to do that? And my manager's like, yeah, of course he wants to do that. I mean, are you kidding me, right? So I get a call and my manager and he's like, what do you think about the Goonies? And I'm like, are you serious? Like, of course I want to do this. I mean, of course I want to throw, you know, throw my cards in it and really try to throw in my hand. But it was quite the challenge. So we sat down and I watched the original movie a dozen times again and came up with a with an idea for a, a new Goonies movie. Um, not exactly a sequel, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really say, um, but sort of like, how do I force awakens the Goonies, right? Yeah, and uh, I, I think again, because I don't know how, how I don't want to go too uh, in depth with it, but there is, there is one thing I, I, I want to say uh, that you, that, that it was, I think was awesome that you did, and this was. Uh, since since uh, Will, when I Willie's treasure was found, the town itself was basically had become hey nobody it's not special anymore because there's no more there's no more treasure to find. Right, totally. It's it's how do you tell this story, you know, thirty something years after the first movie took place, and it's also, you know, I love the Goonies and everyone loves the Goonies, but it's a, it's a it's a product of it, of the year it came out, right? And you really it would be really hard to make that kind of movie today because there's just constraints with the way that the budgets work and just having an all kid cast and all these different things. So it was really, how do I, in a way, bring the magic and tone of the original into today's marketplace and into today's kids and the world of today's kids. And then how do I bring select members of the cast back and have them involved? Um, so I don't know. I don't know if the movie will ever get made. I don't know if there'll ever be a new Goonies movie because it's hard for everyone to agree on something. But uh, you know, Dick has it, and and he's reading it. And I'm just waiting to hear back from him now. So do you ever think, uh, Mike, that you would ever maybe use this treatment uh, as, as sort of like a pitch for for other projects? So maybe like you know, if you ever they they ever said, hey, Mike, what else have you been working on? You'll say, hey, I've worked on this Goonies treatment for for you know, and as, and I pitch it to Richard Donner, and uh, you know, would you ever at, at any point ever do something like that? Absolutely. Every conversation I've had since I've brought that up um, in the room, you know, because everyone collectively loves the Goonies. So when you bring that up and um, if, you know, they want to kind of know what the basis of the, the pitch is and, and you know, it, without giving too much away, you give that to them and then they can kind of see how your mind works when adapting other material, you know, source material, which is key right now because that's what everyone's doing. And it's actually funny because of the, the project that I'm most excited about and currently developing that I can't really say the name of what it is and, and who the players are, but it's two veteran producers um, who've made a, you know, a lot of movies. Um, and it's an adaptation of a classic story by a, a, a well-respected author. And um, I, I partially believe that, you know, it, it was sort of a combination of beneath the surface, which is a SeaWorld world movie um, that script getting me in the door with them. 
And then me saying, you know, oh, by the way, right now I'm also writing a treatment and pitching a Goonie sequel. And here's kind of how I'm doing it and how I'm adapting it. So, uh, so, uh, so as, as you know, you're going to these pitch meetings and as you are sort of working on things, you know, one of the things that you and I always talk about is development and, you know, sort of, yeah. and, and sort of managing expectations. So what are some of the things that, you know, you can sort of discuss about, you know, development? Like, let's just say, for instance, and let's just give it a, a scenario example. Let's just say they, somebody does buy a script. It's a completely original spec script. They were to buy mm-hmm. it. You know, what are, what are some of the things that happen in development? It's interesting. Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, kind of always felt or, or, or still feel that once you get to the point in your career where you're actually meeting with the real producers, you know, not just the assistants or anything like that, but the actual people who can sign a check, that everything just changes. But the reality is, you know, the, the ceiling just gets higher. Right. So you, you climb up to the top of Everest only to realize that there's another like, you know, 600 miles that you can't see because it's so freaking tall. Um, and and that, that's how it feels. So I think, you know, when someone comes along and they buy a spec, they're going to do one of two things. If it's a big spec, like if we're talking, you know, blockbuster temple, they're going to hire a studio writer to do a polish. Um, and that's partially to if it's a if it's a big studio and they're. They've got shareholders that they have to convince. It's that. It's like, well, we'll have the Coen brothers come in and they'll do a polish on all the dialogue and everyone will be happy to give us the money to make the movie. If it's a smaller contained kind of genre film, like a 10 Cloverfield Lane or something like that, then it's a whole different conversation. Then then you could be the sole writer unless they hire a writer director who wants to come in and do a polish as well. The other end of the, the coin is when, in, in the situation I'm in now, is I've had something pitched to me, you know, so I go in and I pitch five movies and they want to make one of the movies I pitch. And then they also, but, you know, but first we want to do one of the ones that, that we're looking at with you. So they pitch me the movie. Then it's, you know, I got to look at the source material, which is a book. I got to figure out how am I going to add my voice or, you know, what's my style with this source material. And then it just begins this really lengthy process of development that nobody really understands. Um, and, I'm just still learning it as I'm, as I, as I go, uh, because one, every executive and producer is different. And two, it's just not something that anybody ever talks about in film school or anywhere else. Um, so in this circumstance, it's, it's very much like, okay, read the book and then give us an outline, right? That was the first thing. It's like, give us an outline, um, of how you would adapt it. So then I sit down and I write, you know, like a 10, 12 page outline and it's basically in prose because that's just how I write my outlines and I send it over to them and they're like, okay, great. Well, come into the office and let's talk about it. So go in the office, they tell me what they love. They tell me what they don't really like. And then they tell me, you know, kind of how to help structure it because a lot of the, the studios, and this is fairly true, think, you know, they categorize writers into two different categories, right? One is a writer who can write character and the other is a writer who can write structure. And the key I think is to really understand character because they can give you the structure. If you can come up with the characters and you can come up with what the real story is behind everything and why you need to tell this story and why these characters are going through what they're going through and not just, you know, by page 12, we're at the inciting incident and blah, 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 save the cat if you can come up with the characters, they are paid to kind of look at it like math and look at it like plotting. So they're going to look at what you give them and they're going to say, okay, so do you think this section of your outline is like the first five pages? And you say, yes, that's the first five pages and then blah, blah, blah. And it helps you, it helps them to plot it in their mind from a producing standpoint. Whereas you, the writer should be thinking about the characters. And when I look at a lot of movies and I see you know, that, and, and I'm, I'm just unhappy with the screenplays. It's because they're coming at it from a complete structure and, you know, stand, or uh, POV and not from character. And I can see it when I watch the movies. And I can also see complacency where it's like, you could have made that better, but you didn't because of one of two things. One, you're getting a paycheck and it doesn't matter because you know they're going to market the shit out of the movie and millions and millions and millions of people are going to see. Two, 
it's because you're nervous. You're in the room with these guys. They have a bad idea and you're afraid to tell them no, or you're afraid to say yes, smile and nod, go home and find out how to best tweak their idea so that it works in the story. And that to me is what development is. It's this long process, six months to a year where you're beating out the story with producers in the hopes that at the end of this process, they're either going to hire you to write the script or they're going to make a deal with you where you spec the script. And then once the project gets funded, then you get paid. And, and, you know, there was an article, I think it was in the uh, Wall Street Journal, about uh, how, you know, why do so many of these, you know, these big budget movies feel the same? And that was, the, the answer was, they think that there's too much, you know, save the cat uh, structure in there. because It's all structure. Yeah. You know, and that's great. I mean, you need structure. But you should be the story guy. The writer should be the story guy. The writer should be the person who makes the audience feel for the themes and the characters and the film or the TV series, the executives, the suits, the money people, they should be the structure guys and girls. They should be the people who are looking at it from a plotting POV so that when they call a director who comes in, they can beat out the ax with the director and he totally understands what they're saying. It's like math, let them do the math, but you have to provide them with the numbers. So, and, and, you know, I was talking to somebody about this, too, was, you know, if you look at movies in, from, like, the 70s and the 80s, you know, there's there's all these, you know, really unique movies. And, and you sort of, as you sort of get to the sort of end of the 90s to now, you can see the big difference. And the big difference right. is it's almost like with now they want to sort of have creativity controlled where they know sort of what they're – they want to have it so it's almost like the project is handheld from all these steps. And they're sort of like, okay, you know, now on page 17, this has to happen. On page 25, this has to happen. Stuff like that. Right, right, totally. It's interesting. I mean, I've never thought about writing like that ever in my life. I've never, I've read all these books and I've taken all these classes and I've, and I understand the logic, but I've never truly approached writing that way. I've always approached it as what is the story? Why is the story relevant? And how do I fit? these characters and these themes into today's marketplace. That's the only math I ever do. I don't worry about what happens by page 30 or page 25 or page 60, not at least until after I've written out an outline or a treatment or even a first draft. Then I start to think, okay, how can I whittle this down? You know, how can I get the action started earlier? But I, I, the, the key is really to just do it, get it finished. And then you can always go back and correct it. Yeah, it, it, it's like Tarantino and the Coen brothers. They don't write, you know, by that either. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of other, like Kevin Smith, Robert Rodriguez. I know those don't, those guys don't write by the whole, like, you know, hey, we have to have this happen by this page and stuff like that. And I think, you know, no, that, yeah. I, and I think what had happened is I think as you sort of try to crack this nut, so to speak, I think that's where you see guys like Sid Field and Blake Snyder with Save the Cat. They sort of wonder you know, okay, how do they write the, the, the somebody, whoever script it is, how do they write this script? And what are, what, do all right. the good, what are all the good things that they have in common? So these scripts that are, you know, the top one percentile, what are they actually doing versus what they're not doing? And I think that's, and that's where all these systems come from, like, you know, and uh, that's where all, all those books come from. Yeah, it's smart to understand, and it's smart to read the books, and it's smart to kind of get what, you know, the end goal is and, and, and understand the structure, but I just, I don't think anything should ever be approached with structure in mind first. I'm not saying you should have a, a first act that goes, you know, 80 pages, but I, I, I am saying that, you know, if you look at some of your favorite movies, like you just said, they're not really going off of any structure. They're going off of what's the best way to tell this story. Yeah. And, and I think also that, I, I think that's why independent film now is sort of having, you know, is sort of why, uh, you know, crowdfunding and everything else, I think as that becomes more popular, that's going to be where, you know, more people are going to say, you know, I could just crowdfund my movie for maybe twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and sh at least shoot it the way I want to rather than rewrite it and try to actually, you know, sell it to an agency or whatever. Right, yeah, and I mean, you can you can definitely do that and there's definitely ways to, to monetize that and build a career off of that. Um, I think my approach is how can I get into the system and not change the system, but just bring that storytelling approach into the system with, with some of the bigger titles and, 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 
and, and bigger films and, and to not be complacent and, and just say yes to everything, but to find the best way to tell the stories. Because if you find the best way to tell a story and you can pitch it to an executive or producer and they know that what you're saying makes sense and is right, they're not going to tell you no. They don't want to make a bad movie. Like the goal isn't to make a bad movie. You just have to be 10 steps ahead and be willing to tell them your idea. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, that that is you know key is is sort of how to communicate, right? So how how do you That's communicate it. something without actually you know nobody wants to say no, uh, but but you also can't say yes, so you have to have, communicate in a different way. Uh, and I remember, yeah, I mean I'm, it's risk management. You know, you have to give them a way that they can tell their boss or tell their financiers or tell the studio that they have a deal with. You have to give it to them so that they can they can express the idea or the the story or the structure or whatever you're presenting them with in the best way to their bosses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, cause that way, you know, obviously uh, it, it, it sort of, you know, ha- that nobody wants to be the person that says no, because I was reading a book about this a few years ago and they said, you know, if you you don't want to tell, you know, the next Vince Gilligan, no. And then, uh, you know, if you, if, if you work for a, that, uh, that, that studio and then all of a sudden it's a hit and then he comes back and says, Oh, aren't you that person that said no to me? Right, no, aren't right. you that guy? <laughs> totally. You're totally right. So, you know, and, and Mike, I just wanted to ask one, uh, I, have, I have a few more final questions. I know we're, we're starting to yeah, run please. out of time as I see that count. I, I, I didn't even, I even realize this, this conversation flew by. I didn't even realize how long we were talking. <laughs> so, you know, for writing competitions, what do you think are yeah. some of the top writing competitions out there right now for writers? Uh, oh, man. I mean, I think it, it all depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to get some representation, then I think, you know, Nichols is always great because it's such a, a, a well-respected contest. I think that the tracking boards contests are really great. I know a lot of people get reps based off of that. If you're trying to make some money, you know, put a little bit of money in your pocket, then I think there's a lot of genre based writing competitions that have money prizes and maybe their contacts aren't as good as some of the other ones but you're going to get some money out of it. So I think it's really how, how, you, how you want to approach it. Do you want to build a career and get representation, or do you want to get like 40G you know, in, the, in the bank? And, and, you know, because I know you, uh, you went through the, you know, Script Shadows uh, website and you were able yeah. to, to, you know, I was just wondering, you know, because I know, again, as we were talking about opportunities, you know, all the different opportunities out there. And, you know, that, that's why I, I asked that question, just to see, because every time I turn around, there's a new writing competition opening up. And Yeah, uh, I, I don't know a lot of them, you know. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not really familiar with a lot of them because I don't enter a lot of them. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think Blacklist is great. Um, if, if you have the money to spend on evaluations, I think, I think Blacklist is, is still a, a very good asset. Like I said, I love the guys at the tracking board. I think what they're doing is, is great, and they have a lot of great, managers and agents on their review boards that that do judge these scripts and they do sign writers and give them other opportunities um and i know that from a genre pov like if you're doing a horror script or a sci-fi script there's tons of great genre contests i don't that are offering cash prizes or or you know the opportunity to pitch a producer or or you know producers are partnering with these contests i don't i just I, i'm not well versed in, in in their names and what they are exactly, but I agree they're they're popping up every day. Yeah, particularly uh, the blood list that came out of nowhere, and uh, when I heard yeah. about what that is, I was like, "Wow, that's a fantastic idea." Yeah, it's a good one, for sure. And by the way, for those listening, the blood list is. Uh, <laughs> we should, I, should, I realized when I said it, Mike. I was like, I probably should yeah. actually explain what Nobody it is. Nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the blood list is the is a is the ranking of the top horror unproduced horror scripts that are out there. And uh, this was put together by I think is it Kelly Marshak is her name or Kelly March? I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's uh it's a, she actually put this together and it's it's sort of like the blacklist but for horror scripts and uh, you know because I'm, horror is so underappreciated, man. And and I was just having this conversation the other day. Like some of the best directors come from horror like even someone like spielberg like if you watch his action sequences and like jurassic park or some of his even like close encounters and et they're all tension and horror based like it's all about building the anticipation for the scare or the reveal and that's all classic horror filmmaking and i think that the genre is totally underappreciated uh especially when you look at so many great directors who come from it 
Yeah, it, it, it's so true. I mean, if you look at all the people who started off with horror, and uh, and you know, it, like particularly like guys like Sam Raimi, uh, they started out totally. With I mean, look at his career. Like it's 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 amazing. He has the career that anyone could dream for. Yeah, he does, and uh, you know, and, and he's so, a great guy. <laughs> yeah, and and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. He, and he's he's been you know making all these great projects, and uh, now look, he's got the Evil Dead TV series, and uh, exactly. And it's great, you know, he's, and he's doing great things with it. He's just, just launched Skydance Television. He's got a whole new TV, you know, production company. And he's, he's really taking advantage of the wonderful opportunity that is today's current TV market. Yeah, and, and uh, that, you know, that's when, uh, you know, you know, I were talking about episodic stuff. And that's something else, too, is, again, because everyone, I swear, Mike, it, it's always about, you know, hey, feature films are great, but, you know, do you have anything episodic? Do you have anything that, like, a, a TV pilot yeah. that could, you know, go on for 18 years? Like, uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but... Yeah, uh, no, totally, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, that, that's always something, too, I, in the back burner that I've always been making sure I have, at least a couple, you know, TV pilots and... Uh, yeah, you know, samples, yeah. Exactly, you know, so anything, you know, just just making up, you know, just to, just in case they actually say, you know, hey, you know, if, what else do you have? And, you know, you're, you're ready to be prepared. And I, and I also think, yeah. like, as we, you know, we talk about expectations and development and, all, and networking and all this stuff as, that we've talked about, I think being prepared... Um, yeah, you know, I, I think you'll agree with this. I don't think you're ever really 100 percent prepared. You can just do what you can do, and if and and sooner or later, if you keep trying, you're going to be in the right place at the right time. You got to love the process. You know, you got to love the process. You got to be willing to get a day job if you need some money. You got to be willing to sleep on a couch if you don't have a place to stay. You just got to love the process of hitting the pavement, finding representation. And taking that and exploiting that to the ends of the earth to meet all these producers and executives and then hoping that you get into development. And then you have to learn to love the process of development, which is hard because it, there's not a lot of money in it. And, you know, if, if there is any money at all, um, it's, it's not a ton up front. So you have to really love the process and love what it, how it feels to crack a story and to negotiate for plot points with executives and, and defend your case. You have to learn to love that. And if you can learn to fall in love with that, then the rest of it is, is, is cake. Very well said, Mike. Mike, uh, so we're, we're just about out of time. And uh, I, I agree, Mike, you have to love that process. And you know, just in closing, Mike, I just want to ask, you know, where can people find you at online? I'm always, you know, I'm on Facebook, uh, Michael K. Snyder. Um, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter, at MK Snyder 1990. Um, I'm always looking for people to reach out and, and connect and if I can help, I'm more than happy to. I'm always looking to collaborate on different things and help put the, the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, and uh, everyone, uh, Mike is a fantastic guy. I've known Mike for years now. And uh, as I'm going through my uh, just my mental Rolodex, Mike, I think I might might have known you longer than anybody else. Oh no, no, no. There's two other people I've had on a podcast who I've known longer than you. So you're like you're like number you're like the third or fourth person in line of people I've known longer. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but because uh, I, I just remember there's a friend I had on here from middle school, uh, episode 150 awesome. with, with Chris Pierminico. and uh, Chris actually te- you know Chris actually was a producer on Game Over, and he also actually now teaches film and TV production. And um, amazing. That was that was a, a fun interview, and uh, I'll give you this little snippet. But uh, it was just funny because he he he's like I'm in, I'm teaching now. He's like so so he's like don't curse, don't tell any weird stories yeah. before. And I'm like, well, oh, Jesus Christ, man, that's all I do is curse and that's tell all weird I have. stories. Yeah, yeah. That's it. if you take that away from me, I'm not Dave Bullis anymore. I, all I do is curse, and tell weird stories. <laughs> That's awesome. That's your voice. <laughs> uh, I, I love I, it. Yeah, very, very true, Mike. Uh, and uh, everyone, it's DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. I'm hoping that Twitter will give me a verified check mark soon enough, Mike. Yes, uh, <laughs> you need it. Um, but but they don't like me too much, and uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you also need a verified check mark, man. I mean, uh, all the cool things you got going yeah. on, and. Um, you know, and uh, Mike, I, again, I, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, you and I have been friends for years. Uh, you know, you're somebody I, whose opinion I really trust, and uh, I really, I really just know that you are going to hit a huge colossal grand slam soon enough. Thanks, man. I, I really appreciate that, and and, and the feeling is mutual, my friend. You know, I I think that yeah, your your opinion is one of the opinions I value more than many others. You know, I, I send you work before other people see it um, because. You're that guy, man. You have you have great taste. Oh, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. 
And uh, everybody, sure. everybody, make sure you go check out Mike. Seriously, he, this guy is always uh, on, on the ball. He's always doing something really, really cool. So please go check out Mike. And, uh, Mike, anytime you want going to come back on, please let me know. I'd love to have you on. And uh, I wish you the best of luck, man, and everything. Thanks, man. I will, uh, I'll take you up on that. It sounds good, buddy. Uh, take care. Have a great cool. Saturday. You too, my friend. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.